the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faith, and kin within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. And now shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, it instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit. Granted by the same Spirit, may be truly wise, and may rejoice in the consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Lady Guadalupe, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray, pray for us. Saint Nation pray, pray for us. For us. All God's angels and saints, pray, pray for us. In the name of the Father. Welcome you to the Ignatian Forum, and we've got Eric Files and Mary Martiran and my Father Ed Broom, and we're going to be following up on a topic that we've been uh, addressing over the past few days, and um, to start out with a, an anecdote story. There was this grandfather that was uh, sitting at the table with his grandson, and um, they were just finishing their dinner. And the grandfather asked the little boy, he said, do you pray your prayers every night? And the little boy said, every night, Grandpa, I pray my prayers. I'm faithful. I never miss a night in which I don't say my night prayers. So the grandfather followed up with another question. Do you pray your prayers every morning? The little child looked dumbfounded at that question. And he said to his grandfather, no, I never pray in the morning. And the grandfather said, why don't you pray in the morning? He said, I pray in the morning because in the morning I'm not afraid. Oh, good answer. In other words, the boogeyman was underneath the bed and to mm -hmm. try to avoid being eaten by the goblins. It's not always the most noble way to pray simply because you're afraid, but at least but it's a, child, a start. A child, that's good for a child that would think of that, I can pray and yes. be okay. And he wanted to arrive at a point where he's praying not simply in the evening, but praying in the morning and other times, right? Because mm -hmm. we can pray any time. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be talking about prayer again, and uh, we had decided yesterday to talk about St. Mary Magdalene, and talked about her the whole time, and you gave your summary of the work of um, Anna Catherine Emmerich, a few of the most salient points in that um, mystical treatise on the life of Mary Magdalene. And um, I think we'd have to say that she became a saint because she really fell in love with Christ. Christ became the center of her life. So when we talk about prayer, uh, we don't say that prayer is transcendental meditation, do we? No. Or Mary, you don't say, this is my mantra. No. You know, that's uh, vocabulary that we try to eschew, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Or rather, the very center of our prayer should be, it should be Christocentric, and it should be Trinitarian. Yes. And it should also be Marian. Yes. So Jesus Christ is the center of our prayer life, as well as the Father, as well as the Holy Spirit. We had decided also two days ago that our topic would be we would return to one of the I believe one of the most authentic sources of writing on prayer over the past hundred years. And it's the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Catechism of the Catholic Church has few numbers on what are called servants of prayer. And they are, servants of prayer would be the family, ministerial priesthood, religious,
catechesis for children. Prayer groups. Right here we have two of the most eminent in that category, namely spiritual directors. No? Those are the servants of prayer. It's from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. <laughs> Excuse me. Eric, would you agree with that? <laughs> would, you, would you agree with the catechism? I do want to disagree. <laughs> so, Father, are you relegating... I'm all these people, do you want to disagree? Father Broom is relegating me to the yes man again today. This is the way we're starting, folks. <laughs> yes, Father. Did I answer well? I do. I do, in fact, agree with the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Amen. Your turn. Father. I also agree. I second that. Okay. Your turn. Father. I have my own microphone. Okay. I thought you would agree with that one anyway. Very rarely do you disagree with me. Well, let's take them one at a time. Okay, uh, I didn't think you were going to be um, <laughs> resistant and giving an, an assent to the... <laughs> do, do you th well, what about the family? Let's talk about that. Uh, how, can, how can the family be a servant of prayer? I think it's a very, very wide topic. How, do you, how would you interpret that? Well, the uh, anecdote <laughs> that you gave was, <laughs> was really a good one for that, right? Yes. The grandfather and the grandson. Yes. And uh, my grandparents were very influential with, um, with my faith also, even though most of my childhood life, uh, they lived a long ways from us because we lived in like Texas, Kansas, Nebraska, Wyoming. Mm -hmm. They lived in the Bay Area. And, but, uh, you know, we would talk to them occasionally over the phone, long distance. But... Uh, they were very devout. Um, my family didn't do a lot of praying together, uh, although my, uh, my mom did teach me to pray. I think the prayer was, bless me, Lord, before I sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I die, if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul should take. I like that. So that's nice. the prayer that I used to say as a child. A poem, huh? And I think I learned... Uh, most of my faith, really, uh, through through Catholic school. So, but the family is extremely important, and if that element is missing, it can be it can be difficult, it can be very difficult for people. I think if they don't have that early uh, family formation, because that is really where it should start. Sure. I, I think uh, also there should be key moments during the course of the day in which the family should try to pray together. I would say that the family should always make sure that when they get up, even though they might be in different bedrooms, to start off the day by prayer, the morning offering, I think that's important. Um, I think it's important also that um, when they sit down to have a meal together, I think that they should pray. I bless the meals, and I think we take it for granted because that was part and parcel of the American Catholic culture of 50 years ago. I don't think ever, ever remember sitting down and not having, uh, saying grace before uh, having dinner with the, uh, it was just part, part and parcel of our culture, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and also praying uh, the family rosary. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the, um, the liner, I'm sure you heard of Father Patrick Payton, mm -hmm. family that prays together, stays together, mm -hmm. a world at prayer is a world at peace. Mm -hmm. That's a struggle. We preached that for many, many years as, uh, as priests. And unfortunately, many people do not, uh, they know 
in the depths of their heart that that should be uh, implemented into their daily routine, but it's not done. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably the devil that crowds that out, mm -hmm. placing other things as greater priorities than praying the family rosary. Mm -hmm. And it can be prayed in 15 minutes, you know, not that you have to really elaborate upon it, you pray it in 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. So the family rosary, I believe, is very important mm -hmm. for the family. Mm -hmm. Then also, night prayers. Mm -hmm. And if the family is, uh, is together at 12 noon, you could, they could pray the Angelus. Mm -hmm. When they uh, leave home, you can ask for a blessing from the Blessed Mother. Mm -hmm. When they come, la come back at Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. going in on vacation, ask mm -hmm. for blessing. And uh, I think both of you would not, I think Eric would give his total consent to this because of your experience with Mary as well as myself. I would say, Eric, you probably agree with the fact that <laughs> there's no reason why we can't pray the rose in the car, right? Have you ever done that? <laughs> the car is, uh, is a major uh, location for the rosary. My, my car is. Really? I mean, if I'm alone. When we went to Yorba Linda to do our Marian yeah. mission, we'd pray sometimes three or four rosaries. You'd be the pilot, I'd be the co-pilot, and um, our chauffeur would be praying along with us, right, Eric? That's right. Yeah. And uh, I started praying a lot in the car when I first started coming here because I was living in San Clemente, and that was 52 miles each way, and I was praying the rosary just about the whole time I was there, whether. I would bring people from South Orange County or not. I mean, if I had other people in the car, we were generally praying the rosary together. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. It's a great place to pray the rosary. Yes. Got to watch the road, though, too. That's yeah, true, yes. <laughs> Mary, up to this point, you've been somewhat mute. Okay? Maybe because you've got that <laughs> the mask covering your mouth, right? Um, but I'm sure you like to add your own two cents, if I can use that expression or your contribution to the importance of family prayer. You think it's important, Mary? I do, and I was blessed to have a family. My dad was a convert. Uh, my mom was a creator Catholic, but <clears throat> when my mom met my dad, she never told him, but he was looking into different religions, and Catholicism was one of them, but she never told him this. She would not have married him if he hadn't become Catholic, but she didn't want that to be the reason, so she just waited to see what he was going to decide, and he chose to be Catholic, and uh, so, um, and then he studied the faith, he really knew the faith. So I grew up in a very Catholic family, Catholic household, we prayed, you know, grace before meals. My mom, when we were out and about, she'd often stop at a church and we'd make a mm -hmm. visit, and uh, so we'd go to daily mass if she could, if not, we'd, because um, I was in school, but sometimes she'd come to the school, we'd, you know, we'd have a daily mass, um, we'd have Sunday mass together, so, um, my dad would read scripture to my younger sister and I, and we'd climb into bed with him, and my mom would cook breakfast on Sunday, and he'd read us from a children's Bible. So I had all those really good memories, really mm -hmm. beautiful memories. So I'm very, very grateful for that foundation in my family. Good. And, and we prayed the rosary when we could, but we couldn't every night, but when we could, we did. Good. Okay, another servant of prayer that we mentioned would be the whole idea of... Um, Ordained ministers, that would be the priest. Presbytery ordinance, which is one of the documents of Vatican II, highlights the, prince of the two principal obligations of the priest, the two Ps, prayer and preaching. Now, I, I think I'm pretty much aware of this, being a priest for quite a few years now. When we had the Mass uh, in the old church, after the Mass, we pray the Rosary in the chaplet. Now, if the priest, after the Mass, he gets up and leaves, and the lay people pray the Rosary, a lot of them get up and leave. When the priest prays the rosary, there's a certain grace there, which the people, the people, um, I think they really appreciate that and enjoy the fact that the priest is leading the rosary. Yes. 
which we've done after the 8 o'clock Mass as well as the 12 o'clock Mass and the 615 Mass. I think that's part of Holy Orders, that there's a certain um, charismatic sacramental grace that flows if we are faithful to, to prayer. Yes. And I think in all, the, all of my ministries, mm -hmm. one of the most salient parts is that of teaching to pray. I think Eric and Mary would agree that the spiritual exercises, is, is that related to prayer? How about uh, my Consecration to Mary book? Oh, yeah. Are they related to prayer? Absolutely. So our programs that we set up are, I would say not even explicitly, but implicit, but explicitly related to prayer because the exercises, it's a prayer experience, right? It's all about Consecration to Mary, isn't that a prayer experience? Yes, it is. Well, do you think that there is a real, a real blessing or dynamic when the ordained ministers really try to promote prayer, Eric? Do you, would you agree with that? <laughs> Another absolute <laughs> affirmation. <laughs> the affirmative. <laughs> uh, You're not debating me on these no, questions. No, huh? I'm not going to do that. The, um, I'll tell you what. When I first came to St. Peter Chanel and experienced the uh, the rosary, which you mentioned, and the priest comes down and, you know, will lead the rosary after Mass, expose the Blessed Sacrament, have adoration and the priest leading. There's something about the paternity of that act by the priest because you've said before, I've heard, when we talk about the family rosary, we talk a lot about the responsibility of the the father to be leading of the family and so that's it's even i would say even more so with the with the congregation of the ch the church the the mystical body of christ the, the you know the the spiritual father leading the flock in prayer and the rosary and as you mentioned <laughs> there's so much in the spiritual exercises and not only, Father, as you mentioned, just not only leading them in the actual, the act of praying, but also, you know, you know, priests like yourself authoring wonderful books on prayer, very powerful. And that's, I believe, that's something that is part of their, their ordained uh, grace and charisms for the priest. There's priests have written many, many, many good books on prayer. Father Ed certainly has, and it's continue. You continue to write books, so praise God for that. Uh, so, and then educating people on how to pray. Really believe once we start to talk about the Carmelite spirituality, we talk about the priesthood and the ordained ministry and the definition of priesthood, his role, I think that that's one of your fortes, one of the things that you really um, like best, right? Yes. So would you like to comment on maybe the, the priesthood and prayer and the priest being a servant of the life of prayer? Um, I had been thinking what Eric said, that the priest is, you're the father of our family, the, the uh, spiritual father of our family, and it's powerful having, having the priest pray with us. It's powerful, our father leading us. And when you, we know the priests are so busy here, there are so many ministries you're, and classes you're taking care of and sacraments, for you to take time to pray the rosary, it, it even makes it more powerful. That that's how important you think it is. You stop everything and you pray the rosary with us. So that's very, very powerful. But um, I also think that you're oblates of the Virgin Mary and you keep Mary very close to your heart. And um, I know you pray four rosaries a day. And so I I don't think all priests have, they don't obviously don't have that charism. Um, many of them are diocesan priests. They're good priests. But they don't necessarily have that connection with Mary, and it might, and I, I don't think they necessarily promote the rosary. Uh, or I'm sure that I know that in other parishes, lay people stay and pray the rosary. I know that I see it when I've gone to other parishes. But I understand if priests don't stay. So I think it's very particular to the oblates of the Virgin Mary. It's one of the charisms you have, one of the gifts you have that you bring us very, very close to Mary and through her favorite prayer, the rosary.
Beautiful. Then the next servant of prayer in the catechism of the Catholic Church would be the servant of prayer of religious. Eric, uh, test your theological, theological acumen this afternoon. What is the difference between a diocesan priest and a religious priest as we enter this topic of religious as being uh, servants of prayer? Are all priests the same in that, in that respect? No, they're not. What's the difference? The, you mean a diocesan priest is, um, is much different in, in a number of different ways than a religious priest. A religious priest is part of a religious order and they have specific vows and they also have probably, I mean, different charisms. I would say that diocesan priests have charisms as well, but they have more, uh, I would say, into more freedom to do specific things. Um, I think the typical vows for most religious would be poverty, chastity, and obedience, and then other orders have additional, like, fourth vows, like support and obedience to the Holy Father. The Jesuits, right? Yes. Yeah. So, St. Ignatius of Loyola. So, um, and then there are, uh, within specific religious orders, there are um, specific charisms that they have as well. And, you know, we're familiar with the Oblates of the Virgin Mary. Uh, and Mary just mentioned one of the big ones is, the you know, beautiful devotion to our Blessed Mother. Uh, and the devotion uh, to her. But also... A number of the other ones would be um, to, um, you know, fighting modern heresies, promoting good reading, promoting the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. Um, and there are a number of other ones. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, I'm sure off the top of my head, those are the ones that I think are, are really important to me. So, um, you know, again, uh, religious orders vary in size. Father, you said there's less than what? There's less than 15,000 oblates of the Virgin Mary. <laughs> you know, what's the real number, Father? About 150. It's a small <laughs> but very uh, beautiful and powerful religious order. And so we're glad to be here. I'm glad you specify that because uh, I think a lot of people, most Catholics, don't know the difference between a diocesan priest and a religious priest. And you know, one is, yeah, we have a founder, we have our charism, we have the vows, we have community life, we have our charismatic grace, we have our constitution. Uh, we usually have meals together, we pray together, um, and that's, uh, that's important to know that. And been part of the, the role of the religious also is to promote prayer. Whether you're a Carmelite, a Jesuit, a Dominican, or Augustinian, we're all called to promote prayer. Because prayer is, the, that's our topic the past three or four days. That is, the prayer is so, so extensive. And um, just seeing a a, a priest kneeling down praying, a religious kneeling down praying, is a very powerful example. You know, um, remember when I went to to Villanova years ago? There was a, there was a priest. His name was Father Quinn. He's probably passed away since, but I'd be sometime praying in the in the church. He'd come in, he'd kneel down on the cold marble floor, fold his hands, and for about five minutes, just wrapped in really deep prayer. And uh, that was kind of like a stepping stone for me to want to be a priest, mm -hmm. seeing this priest that was so, um, so humble, so fervent, and um, so prayerful that uh, I felt, well, that's, that's really, I feel I'd like to be as a priest one day. If, I, if I'm ordained, I want to spend time in front of the Blessed Sacrament. I want to be kneeling, wrapped up in in um, contemplative prayer when I go before the Blessed Sacrament. It's how interesting how the example of a priest can influence a future priest wow. just by his, um, his um, demeanor, by the way he, he lives out his religious life. Mm -hmm. 
He would say this, Mary, you have a daughter that's a religious and um, yesterday I got a, a phone call from one of the uh, Carmelites of the Sacred Heart, one of your, your, your daughter's order, asking about spiritual direction and how they might be able to get involved in that. And um, she said she was going into retreat today for about eight days. But um, she ended related this topic. They, they always, they always, wonderful nuns. She said, you know, during this tough time, Father, we're really praying for you and for your your religious community. We're really keeping you in our prayers. And that, uh, just that closing um, note on that, that was just a, a phone um, phone mail that she left for me. That uh, That's encouraging. And often they'll say, when we go on a retreat, the eight-day retreat, they'll say that they're, they're praying for us. Mm -hmm. And during the eight-day retreat, I, I, they, they pray a lot for us in the eight-day retreat. And I, not only one, but I think the whole community takes yes, seriously to pray for us and maybe offer a communion for us. Uh, mm -hmm. What is your experience with maybe we're talking about the servants of prayer, religious nuns in prayer, Mary. Given your daughter, I mean, she's been a, a perpetual vow probably a good seven years now, right? Back to 2013, was it? 13, yeah, so seven years of final yeah. vows. And good memory, don't I? Yeah. Good, good yeah. memory. Yeah. Well, Mary, what do we, what do we have to say? Let me take your mask down a little bit so we can hear you better. Okay. Um, well, the Carmelites, um, of course, uh, one of their charisms is to pray for priests. Yes. And uh, they do um, support priests with prayer, and they have a very contemplative prayer life. Um, it's one of the things I love about the Carmelites of Alhambra, semi-contemplative, they have active ministries, but their first, their first um, priority is their contemplative prayer life. And they pray in community two times a day that I know of, maybe three times, but in community, um, wherever, they, whatever, wherever they're stationed. But they pray for priests, and then Carmelites pray for priests. That's what they do. And um, they lift priests up, you know, to, to our Lord to, so that um, he can bless them and, and conform them or to himself. That's the idea, that he conforms priests to himself, and that's what they pray for. So um, I'm very grateful for that. And uh, I, with my daughter, I share that charism, um, a desire to um, pray for priests, lift priests up, to have that contemplative prayer life through the exercises. I've learned that, but um, my heart, I'm, I resonate with the, the, the vocation of my daughter. So she could be a Carmelite, and I wouldn't necessarily have a Carmelite heart, but I do have. Our Lord gave me that Carmelite heart, and I resonate with that in my personal prayer life. So um, I find great joy in praying for priests. And, um, I think that's really important in the world that priests have have many prayers, many many prayers, because as you said once, you're you're far priests are far more attacked by the enemy and tempted than lay people because, you know, who who would the devil prefer to knock down? You know, I'm just one person, but what if he could knock down a priest? You know, who's 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 ministering to thousands of people? That's powerful. All right. So from his viewpoint, that's that's his target. So um, you go after the big gun. You don't go after the little little peon. <laughs> you know, the peon. What what does that matter? <laughs> all right. So that's why we should pray. All of us should pray for priests. All of us should be caramelized at heart in that sense of praying for priests because we've our world's never been in more danger, never been had more crises of faith and of morals and of um, charity and. So we need our priests more than ever, and um, and so we should pray for them more than ever because the the enemy that's that you're, you're his target. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Yeah, well, I was just thinking about that. Um, the fact that when I walked out the door after the mass at ten o'clock, um, there was a line of people waiting to go to confession, and I confessed a whole two hours, probably maybe 40 people, 30 or 40 people in the afternoon too, is how these people are dependent upon the priest. Absolutely. You know, um, and how we can be the instrument to move them from from maybe not being the state of grace to the state of grace by a three-minute confession. And this could result in the salvation of their soul. 
I don't think the devil was happy with that. No. So no. if the devil not is happy with that, you know, he, you know, he'll try to rattle our cages, no, yes. one way or another. No. Yes. Yeah. So I think you're, what you're saying is true. Go after you said the big gun, mm -hmm. and go after the general in the army mm -hmm. to knock him down. Mm -hmm. That's and then why. The whole army's disarrayed. It's true, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So true. I think you should pray for the yes. sanctification of priests and religion because you're at the mercy of the priest. Mm -hmm. Like if, uh, if I'm not going out there, the, those 30 people, they're not going to go to confession. Mm -hmm. And they, so they, they, they go home with their sins, right? Mm -hmm. and the fact that they're liberated from their sins, you know, having your conscience at peace mm -hmm. is worth more than a million bucks. Yes, it is. I really believe that. Yes, it is. Can I have one thing? Yes, and then Eric. I'm, I'm just going to add something. When Father Ed was on Relevant Radio um, last week on an interview with Chuck Neff, and uh, he, Father Ed talked about right now he's doing four hours of confession six days a week, and the host, Chuck, was stunned. There was a silence, and he said, I've never heard of such a thing, ever. And I thought, Yes, that's the Oblates of the Virgin Mary. Yes, Mother, you're, they're getting honor now in your name. Well, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm, can I expound upon that a little bit? Okay. You can teach catechism, so can Eric. You can teach the exercises. You can put together a, a PowerPoint, which is very well done for the uh, rules. You can direct people, and you are, sometimes hours on end, to the point of you know, getting really exhausted because it can be tiring, right? You can do it also. You can teach catechesis. You can help to consecrate the people to the Blessed Mother. You can put the scapula on them. But you can't give them absolution. No. No. So my thought is this, is that only the priests can do that. And given that there are less and less priests, and like I've heard up in Sacramento, though all the churches are closed down, no sacraments up in Sacramento, no? It's a pretty big diocese, too. That's the capital of the, of the state. Yeah. I feel that uh, I should be faithful to my charism as priest and religious to be present. And the beauty is this, uh, Mary, is my giving you absolution, it does not depend upon my emotional, physical, or sentimental state. I could be there and my mind is kind of swimming with weariness and um, uh, I can be just exhausted and I could be there and I, I don't have a, a clown smile on my face. <laughs> <laughs> Can't always put it there, mm -hmm. but as long as you here, I am Mary, I absolve you of your sins in the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mm. Absolutely, freedom, freedom. Ex opera operato. Mm -hmm. What that means is the Latin for Operation. the, the grace of God works ir irrespective of the emotional state of the priest, or even his moral state for that matter, mm -hmm. no? Mm -hmm. the, the individual is forgiven. So my thought is this, that is the, the riches that I can give it, it really is spiritual riches, yes. which I think it depends upon salvation that, if I can be available to as many people as possible so that they can reconcile themselves through confession, I'm going to be there until the Lord calls me I pray that you know I'm, my mind doesn't go south. I pray that um, I'm able to hear at least with one of my ears. Did you hear that, Eric? <laughs> yes. Okay. okay, good. So, um, and even a religious priest being a servant of prayer, if you don't go to confession and you're in the state of mortal sin, the prayer is just not going to like a lead balloon. That's right. It's not going to go anywhere. No, so I think there's a relationship between priest, religious confession, as well as prayer. What do you think, Eric? I think they're all connected, they're really. I think they are. Good point. Good point.
Yes, this pandemic has really illuminated that whole reality. Like you said, I, I didn't, I'd heard some things about what's happening in Sacramento, but uh, we're kind of in a kind of a second lockdown now. But uh, here at St. Peter Chanel, I'm so grateful that we have three masses a day. And like you said, confession, um, almost, I mean, not, you know, almost to the way we had it before, four hours a day, we had, you know, more masses before, and we had confessions during the masses. But thanks be to God and to our priests here that they've really kind of turned that whole, uh, you know, absence and deprivation, really. Uh, that was really painful. It was painful for for us not to have as direct access to going to mass and to uh, to going to confession for a long period of time, uh, and not you know not having that ability to do that. So it's what a comfort it is to to know that we can go to mass, we can receive our Lord in communion, and we can go to confession. And, you know, work out our salvation with the sacraments. Um, and, you know, as part of what we're talking about today, um, the most powerful prayer is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. So, of course, you know, having um, a priest, you know, the, there's a saying that we say all the time, no priest, no Mass, no Mass, no consecration, no consecration, no communion, no communion, we're orphans, and we're feeling that a little bit for the last few months, but thanks be to God, we've got, you know, confession twice a day, two hours a shot, to, and so they're, they're, it's good to see the long lines again. It's good to see those lines here. It's uh, edifying. You, Chuck Neff, as you mentioned, Mary, Chuck Neff um, was astounded that, was uh, astounded. that a priest could be there confessing four hours. I've almost done that almost my whole life as a priest, mm -hmm. just that Father Greg's job was the same. Father Greg is more or less in the same line, too. That we're all, well, it's all almost part of our essence, who we are. Is that you got people to confess, be there for them. Um, and he asked, you know, how do you, how do you really promote it? Because he started off the program, maybe you don't remember. He started the program, he says that the confession lines are pretty small in many places, which, which is, is the case in many, many parishes and many dioceses. Whereas both of you have been coming to this parish for quite a few years. Uh, before the um, pandemic, um, often me and Father Craig would be confessing at the same time. And we would, um, remember this one lady said, I was number 34 in your confessional line number 34. Very rarely were we ever able to finish hearing the confessions when we sit sure. there. Sure. And we we'll get up, almost always there's, there's people waiting online. But he asked the question, I think the key, if we can maybe go through those points, mm -hmm. the key to getting people to go to confession is number one, I told Chuck Neff this, the, t the key to becoming a good confessor is that we have to be good penitents. I may be a, I may be a, a I, I could be a better penitent than all the penitents that come to me. I've experienced the mercy of God in confession maybe more than you. Which is very beautiful because if I've experienced in the very depths of my heart not simply reading theological treatises written by Tom, Thomas Aquinas, which is fine. Mm -hmm. Thomas is great, isn't he? Mm -hmm. great. But experiencing in your own flesh, yes. your own conscience, your own soul. Yes. Once you've experienced that, yes. I remember as a child just experiencing so many graces in, in confession, I think God was preparing me. Oh, beautiful. That uh, I, I really try to prepare myself well. I try to listen and to really... I took it very seriously as a little kid. Mm -hmm. So I think to become a good uh, confession, you have to be a good penitent. I agree. Second is you got to preach it. You got to preach it. 
And by preaching, you have to preach what the sacrament is. Mm -hmm. You got to preach the Ten Commandments. I'm glad he's able to go through the five classical steps in the program. And then after that, if, you, if you're a good penitent and you preach it, you got to be there. Yes. Yes. You have to open the door. You got to be there. You got you to gotta be um, there at the post. Mm -hmm. You got to show up for duty, huh? Mm -hmm. And then I think you have to confess, try to confess well. Mm -hmm. And Mary and Eric, I think, as a confessor, there has to be a harmonious blend between God's infinite mercy and justice. There has to be a harmonious blend. You know what that means? Mm -hmm. Is that mercy is number one, but also justice is also part of it. Mm -hmm. God's mercy is infinite, but justice in the sense that um, sin is something serious. Mm -hmm. And that's why that's why you're given a penance to repair for our past sins. Mm -hmm. Then, the um, last thing I would say is get lay people to really promote it. Mm -hmm. Because we can't do all of it. Right. Get lay people to give out an examination of conscience, to encourage. Now, both of you, I think, would agree with me on this. You're not going to debate me, and you really haven't as of yet today. <laughs> and you usually are somewhat of a peaceful temperament is um, when we do the general confessions, we really work in getting them to go to confession. After they come out of the confessional, you embrace them, and you can see sometimes, I imagine tears coming, yeah. tears of joy coming out of their eyes. Yeah. Yeah. Is that true, or is that just, just a fi true. figment of your imagination? That's true. Absolutely. So beautiful. beautiful. So Eric, um, not that I'm entering novelties into your uh, mental schema here because you, 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 you've been exposed to this for many years. But I think that uh, the field of dreams, you remember that movie? Yes, I if do. If you build it, they'll come. If yes. you promote it, people will come. Would you agree with that, Eric? It's true. And <laughs> in the spiritual exercises, uh, that is really one of my most favorite parts of the uh, program. It's the pinnacle. We call it the pinnacle of the program mm -hmm. uh, is that general confession. You talked about it uh, with Chuck Neff the other day. And it's very rewarding for us because we see lives change, being changed. Uh, and that's really one of the anchors for the transformation that somebody is going to have mm -hmm. to be able to. There's, there is no price you can put on a clear conscience and to see somebody people come in they have may not been to confession for decades they come into that program and then uh, they will do and they have, there are incredible transformations that we see taking place and for us to be able to witness that through the the sharing groups um, ap after the general confession the sharing that we have is uh, it's so beautiful and uh, edifying for us and so many good stories. But everybody that shares that, um, it, it really builds the, the trust and the faith in that sacrament for, for the entire group mm -hmm. as a group. So the importance of actually teaching them well, having them go, th walking them through the process, and then making a, probably the best confession of their life in the spiritual exercises. Uh, and like you said, Father, um, as a priest, it's one thing to be studying something and looking at something intellectually, but the experiential part of it for a priest and for all of us is the most important because I've talked about my general confession many times, and it's a life-changing event. If done well, it changed my life. And the... Um, the benefits that are palpable, even at a you know at our own level, uh, you know, what a change it, it it makes in in a person's life to have probably the greatest peace they've had for a long time, maybe in their whole life. 
you know, as an adult, I think after I made my general confession, uh, I, I would say that the peace that I experienced after that and the joy, uh, I don't really remember too many other times in my life when I felt that much at peace. There's a book that came up maybe about 30 years ago by Marianne Budnick. And the name of the book was Seeking Peace, Try Confession. And the name of this author, Marianne Budnick was her name. Uh, she wrote another woman, a print book on uh, Plan of Life for Women, I think it was maybe 25 years ago. One of the things that really struck me about that um, that book related to our topic, she said that in her family, when her family members or kids started to become snappy, short, maybe talking back, fighting, um, disrespectful, she, she noticed this, ah, the family has not gone to confession for a month. And the ones she and her husband would take the kids to confession, there was a palpable difference, she noticed, in the whole ambience in the family with respect to greater peace. Beautiful. What do you think, Mary? Do you think there's something in that? There there is, and I have another example of that, and that is that Scott Hahn <coughs> converted before his wife Kimberly did. They were, um, he was a Protestant, what was it, Presbyterian? Presbyterian. Presbyterian, and she had a Presbyterian father, Kimberly Hahn did. She married a Presbyterian minister, it was Presbyterian minister father, married a Presbyterian minister husband, her brother was a Presbyterian minister, and she wasn't about to become Catholic, but, but she let him do it, all right? But she noticed something. When he'd get about a month after having gone to confession, he'd start getting short with the kids, short with her, short-tempered. And she'd gently say, Scott when, was la Scott, when was the last time you went to confession? It's been a while, hasn't it? He'd go, you know, it has. I, I should go. She goes, yeah, you should go. <laughs> she saw the effects of confession. And then one time she was helping, um, she still wasn't Catholic, but she was helping uh, Scott. They were working with some kids making their first communion, going to make their first communion, so they were doing their first confession. And it was, uh, it was like a Sunday school thing, you know, for kids that came on Sunday school, and they were preparing them for that. So she was helping as an aide, and uh, the kids were lined up in the, in the row for, um, to go to confession, and she was helping, you know, making sure they got went one, one went out, one went in. So this little girl came out, and she was crying, and Kimberly said, what's wrong? And she said, he said to say three Hail Marys. She said, well, Sam. She goes, I don't remember how to pray them. And Kimberly thought, I can't pray the Hail Mary. I don't even believe in that. I'm not Catholic. And she looked at that little girl, and she said, but she really needs those Hail Marys. She, she was a terror. This little girl was a terror. She really needs those Hail Marys. And so she went to her mentally, Lord, forgive me, forgive me. And she said, this is how you say it, Hail Mary, full of grace. And she walked <laughs> her through it, but she was mentally thinking, Lord, forgive me if this isn't the right thing to do. But there you go. She saw the power of confession. Yeah. She knew that little girl needed confession because she, she was a real terror. And she knew that she needed to pray the penance. And so she helped her. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. I remember hearing another story of Scott Hahn and confession. Um how it is important for us to take the sacrament seriously, to not to be flippant or nonchalant. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a story of, he was not a Catholic yet. Mm -hmm. And he was a teenager, one of his friends' name was Dave, and Dave was a Catholic. Mm -hmm. And he said um, that Dave would go to confession but because his parents forced him, but he, it just, um, he um, didn't do it well, almost made fun of it, just to throw out some s stuff there. But Scott said that he went um, back to meet him years later, hearing that he was going through a tough time. And he 
knocks on the door and the mother opens up the door and says, God, I haven't seen you in years. What's, uh, what's going on? And so he talks a little bit to the mother. It was Dave. And she said, well, Dave's gone through a tough time. He's really been depressed lately. And uh, so um, he's upstairs in his room if you want to go and talk with him. So this guy goes up and he sees Dave. Dave is shocked to see him. So uh, he's got something in his pocket. But uh, after talking for a few minutes about the, the old times, um, Scott um, asks, uh, uh, Dave asks Scott, why, were you, why did you come today? He just, I felt inspired just to visit you to see how things were coming. And uh, Scott had said, uh, uh, Dave said, that I'm glad you came because uh, before you came, I had a, a rope in my pocket I was about to go out in the back of the yard and hang myself. Wow. And one of the reasons why is that uh, it was kind of mocking the sacrament of confession. So we want to take it seriously. And Scott says in one of his talks that confession is like fire. Fire can warm you up, but if you get too close, fire can burn you. So I think that we should not be flippant or nonchalant or take the sacraments with a grain of salt. I think we should really try to prepare for them and receive them seriously. Eric, what do you think? It's a powerful story, isn't it? But it's, uh, it's, it, there's, a, there's a powerful message there, I think, for all of us, no? Yeah, that's, <clears throat> that, that is a very amazing story. And, you know, in God's providence, uh, you know, with, you know, working through Scott Hahn, uh, it's a beautiful story. And <clears throat> the, uh, that's why I think, um, I think that overall we experience in the program I think a lot of Catholics uh, sometimes come in if they if they haven't been catechized very well, they have a fear of confession, and it's um, because that they don't really understand it or maybe understand the supernatural value of confession and the importance of confession and the importance of frequent confession. And so that's why, Father, you were talking about the basics. You were, you know, I was listening to your, uh, to your show the other day about, you know, and which is what you do during our spiritual exercises class, as well as all of us, Mary and I, when we teach, uh, when we get into the general confession part, we go through the, the five basic steps. And sometimes people aren't even familiar with that. And once they start to assimilate that, they assimilate it uh, intellectually, and then they do a good preparation, and and then when they actually make their general confession, then it turns. It really helps them to turn the corner and understand that father. And they take it. I think they do take it more seriously because they've experienced how important it really is and the value of it through God's grace, mm -hmm. through His providence and His grace, His providence in bringing them here or somewhere where they can go and experience God's mercy. You mentioned that earlier, the power of experiencing His mercy as a priest to be able to administer the sacrament and understand that even better because you know, you know what it's done for you. In the um, Carmelite Sisha, the Sacred Heart and the Sacristy, Mary, there's a plaque that I'm sure, sure you and Eric have probably read more than once. In the plaque, it says, um, it's directed specifically to the priest. And it is, uh, priest, man of God, celebrate this Mass as if it were your first Mass. Celebrate this Mass as if it were your last Mass. Celebrate this Mass as if it were your only Mass. Uh, I've always been impressed by that. Mary, do you think we can apply that um, maxim or dictum to confession? We could even say, go to confession as if it were your first confession, 
go to confession as if for your last confession, go to confession as if for your 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 only confession. Mary, do you think there's some parallel there between these two sacraments? What do you think? Very beautiful <clears throat> parallel that you pointed out. Very beautiful application of that yes. saying. And you know, I've never I try and make a good confession, but I've never thought of it that in yeah. those specific terms. I love that, and I will do that from now on, especially after the pandemic. When and I mentioned before, I for three months I I didn't go to confession. I didn't have time to go down to the Norbertines where people were, would go there because they were hearing confession. Yes. I didn't have time to do that, so I didn't have a window. I, I suffered, and so I'm so grateful to have confession. And I, I love what you just said, and boy, I'm going to apply that because you know what? I don't know when it will be my last confession because they're going to shut us down or because I'm going to die. So, and I, you know, we teach in the exercises. I don't know when the time of my, my, my hour is. My, it might be the minute I leave here. I don't know. So I love that, and I'm going to apply that to confession from now on. Yes. Consciously. Yes. Eric, uh, wasn't it true that um, I think you have... Um, some Hawaiian blood, uh, Portuguese, Portuguese, Hawaii, Hawaiian, yes. Portuguese Hawaiian blood. What was the greatest suffering of Father Damien when he was on the Molokai Islands? You remember that? You seen that movie of Molokai? He yes, was, he was in a leper colony, and there was no other priest there to hear his confession. So he had to rendezvous with a ship, and he had to not just say it out loud but very loud to a priest that was up on the deck of the ship because the priest couldn't be exposed to the uh, the leprosy and so i think that he was able to, he knew a uh, different language uh and so they would where they would uh they would talk in a different language but still uh his greatest deprivation was not having access to regular confession and that's very difficult. In fact, Father, that thought occurred to me when we were, um, you know, uh, going in the lockdown before. I just like, what is this going to come to? Is the priest going to have to, because we were all had to be isolated and not risk uh, infection with the priests. So the priests, I can imagine them sitting up on an upstairs window, <laughs> and people having to shout their confession up to the priest. I mean, you know, it would get to the point where people would be willing to do that. Uh, so, um, in fact, uh, that reminds me of something <laughs> about the story of Fatima that I read is the eyewitnesses to the miracle of the sun. There was actually people that were, uh, were speaking their sins out loud when they saw that coming. So um, they understood the, the importance of, of the sacrament of confession when they're willing to do that in, in public. So we've gotten through half of the servants of prayer in the catechism, and the first would be that of the family, the next would be ordained minister would be the priest, and then we've gotten through religious. So I think we have another three or four to go. We can maybe follow up in this conversation tomorrow. What do you think? Great. We've already read, it's almost three o'clock, so I'll give you my blessing, if you're not in a hurry, stay with us and we'll pray the chapel of divine mercy. The Lord be with you. And with, and with your, your spirit. spirit. Intercession of God's angels and saints. May God bless you in a very special way. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.